right, we're going to talk tonight about oysters. As Dennis said, you see a pattern here. It's things you can eat, all right? That's, uh, that's the pattern, and I love all types of shellfish. Um, but if I was an oyster and I had to worry about diseases and I had to worry about um, over harvesting and now this thing called climate change, I might have the blues. I'm going to start at the very beginning and I'm going to assume that you don't know anything about oysters. So we're going to go through a lot of little facts before we actually get to diseases, which I find interesting, but for some of you may be a bit boring. And how does uh, climate variability and change impact that? And then what can we do about all that? Uh, most people, when they think of oysters, they just think of food. Uh, some people like them and some people have the waiter's opinion. So what are oysters? Uh, they are bivalve mollusk, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. They live in a variety of habitats from full strength seawater to lower salinities that you find in estuaries. They can settle on a variety of substrates, other oyster shell, mud. They're filter feeders, which is important for the environment. And they can change sex, which makes them interesting. Uh, in uh, science, we have a fancy word for that. It's called protandric, where you start out as a male and you change to a female. And then some oysters, some species actually can change back and forth more than once, which is even more interesting and confusing. So what's a, what's a mollusk and what's a bivalve? A mollusk, the mollusk family is a very large family. Everything from terrestrial snails to squid, um, to the ancient chitons and uh, bivalves. A bivalve is simply uh, a mollusk with two shells. The shells are very similar in size, and if you want, you can kind of think of a, uh, a round box with a soft animal inside. There are 20,000 species of bivalves, and they include oysters, clams, mussels, and scallops. We do not have time to talk about all those, so I had to pick one, so I chose oysters. We can divide oysters into those we can eat and those that we can wear. I guess you could put it that way, the pearls. And then other oysters, which uh, maybe look like an oyster, or they're eight, but not commercially, or they form pearls, but not the nice uh, pearls that we think of. Tonight, we're just going to focus on edible oysters. Uh, there are four genera of them, and these are the ones we find in the United States. And basically, all my talk's going to, well, I should say North America, not just the United States. And so that's what the talk is going to be centered on, things that affect things in North America. And these are the species that we eat. Uh, our oyster in Florida and in the Gulf, Atlantic side and the Gulf side, is the eastern oyster. All the other four oysters are found on the Pacific coast. Oysters are broadcast spawners. That means that they release their eggs and their sperm into the ocean and fertilization just takes place within the water column itself. There are a couple oyster species that actually keep the eggs inside and fertilization uh, takes place within the oyster and then they release them. Temperature plays a big role in when a oyster or other bivalve spawn it plays a big role in a lot of marine animals. When the temperature warms up is when they release their eggs and their sperm. They are part of the plankton for the first oh, two to six weeks of their lives, depending on the species. Uh, they're called zooplankton at that time, and they swim around, and they eat particles and smaller things than them out of the water calm. And then they develop a foot, and they look for a place to settle. Uh, another oyster, preferably, or some other substrate that they find at the time that they begin to settle. And the adults, they become adults. This can vary depending on species and location. At a colder temperature, like up in Canada, you might not reach adult size for four or five years. Here in Florida, 
it may be under two years. Oysters have been around for a long time. Uh, we find them 200 million years ago on the fossil record. We find them in caves in South Africa along with animal bones, which shows that people were eating them 164,000 years ago. Uh, the Greeks gave us that wonderful word that we all think of when we think of eating oysters, aphrodisiac. And that comes from the goddess uh, Aphrodite who rose up out of the sea on an oyster shell and she gave birth to Eros, the god of love. And so oysters have been associated with love since that time. The Greeks also gave us a word ostracize. They used to use oysters as ballots. They would write on them and hold them up. Uh, I think the Greek word for oysters, ostracon or something like that. But the Romans, the Romans were responsible for culture in European, and most of us have a European background. The Romans really loved oysters. They discovered oysters when they conquered Britain and they conquered Gaul. And uh, the British, they didn't care for oysters and they told the, the Romans they could have them. Uh, and the Romans did, they took them back, they began to culture them in Italy, and they even came up with a coin called the denarius, which was worth one oyster. So that's, that's how much they enjoyed oysters in Rome. Coming over to this side of the pond, taking a look at U.S. history, the American Indians used oysters for food, but for a lot of other things too. Oysters are a very good food source. They're high in protein, vitamins, minerals, and they're low in cholesterol, so they're healthy for you. The colonists also used them for other things besides food, and back then they were a poor man's food. Everybody ate, you made a meal on oysters, you didn't just eat hors d'oeuvres like we do now. Uh, however, with the industrial age, somebody or some groups of people got an idea that, hey, this is a this is something we can do and make a living at. And so they bought him a boat, some tongs and some dredges. And here's a picture from the early 1900s, late 1800s in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and you can see just loads and loads of oysters just there for the, there for the taking if I have a boat. On the other hand, uh, they took a little too many. Uh, didn't leave enough to spawn and produce more oysters. And so, from the 1800s down to now, this is where oyster production has fallen. And Chesapeake Bay in the North Atlantic area, which was formerly known as the oyster place, traditionally has fallen lower than anybody else, so that they now only produce 3% of the oysters that are landed in the United States. Actually, the Gulf Coast has been a lot more steady. I think it's this green line here. And they actually now produce the most oysters. Uh, 60, well, harvest the most oysters, 67% of oysters are harvested from the Gulf. Oysters are important for more than just food. Uh, they are a good model for telling us whether changes are going on in the ecosystem, uh, whatever those changes might be caused by. They don't move, and so when they die, it's pretty easy to determine how mortality and percent mortality. That shell doesn't fall very far from the oyster when it dies. They're also cold-blooded, and so any changes in temperature, uh, the oyster will be affected by it. People also take note of problems with oyster beds because it's the most valuable commercial molluscan species in the world. And so if it's something you can eat or you can pet, um, something that is a commercial value for us as humans, we pay more attention to it than if it is not. An oyster bar is not the place you go to eat oysters. It's not all it is. It's another name for a reef, a bank, or a bed, and those are all synonymous depending on where you come from. Uh, they're just an aggregation of dead and living oyster shells. And you can find oysters either intertidally, and that's what this picture shows here. Intertidally means when the tide goes down, you can see the oysters. 
Subtitle means they're always covered by water. Shape is determined by what substrate they settle on and how dense they're together in an oyster bar. If they settle on hard shell, they tend to be more round. If they settle in mud, they tend to be vertical, long and narrow. And if there's a whole lot of them crunched together, they also tend to be long and narrow. Oyster beds or bars provide protection against waves and current. Uh, they also influence water flow patterns, and that helps to accumulate sediment around uh, oyster bays, bars, <laughs> and they are a stabilizing force too. And then that creates areas where seagrass beds and mangroves can form, and so all of a sudden you have a much larger ecosystem created. They're important as habitat for a lot of different species. When we go out to monitor oysters, John and I, we always see a lot of barnacles, mussels, sponges, and tunicates. I don't know how well you can make those out here, but we always see a, a wide variety. And as the months go by, we see that change, the, the diversity of the, of the fauna and flora. We always see a lot of crabs. There's one in the oyster up here. Oyster habitat is good for a nursery for fish, and they also, in turn, eat some of the other animals that are associated with the reefs. The birds, in turn, forage for the fish that are there. And so everybody gets the benefit of the oyster. Invertebrates find them particularly tasty. They like them young when the shell is still thin. And so crabs are big predators, all species of crabs on oysters, as are sea stars, flatworms, and oyster drills. This is a picture of an oyster drill and the eggs that lays on the oysters. And they just drill down in there and, and suck the contents out. Um, the oyster catcher is usually seen around oyster bars. There's some dispute as to whether it's using that as foraging ground and how much of the oysters it's, it's it's eating, actually, um, but it is associated, and people consider it uh, an oyster predator. And then we have the ultimate oyster predator, which is us. Another thing that oysters do is they clean the water. They eat the plankton and the particles that are in the water. And depending on the size of the oyster and the species, the average uh, is that they filter 25 gallons a day. That's a lot of water to filter. And as they filter, they get food themselves. They have a, a little mouth area across from the hinge where water comes in, goes over the gills, uh, is taken in through the intestines, and then makes its way out again. At one time, there were so many oysters in Chesapeake Bay that it was, it's estimated that they could filter the water within three days. Nowadays, it's almost a year to filter that water. We need more oysters there. So now I'm going to bore you a bit with oyster diseases, which I find fascinating, but <laughs> you may not. Uh, we can divide diseases into a lot of categories parasitic diseases, bacterial diseases, and then diseases of unknown etiology. There are about 20 diseases that affect oysters worldwide. All these are just diseases that are found in North America. They may be found elsewhere too, but they're found in North America. One thing I want to point out about uh, diseases is the only ones that affect humans directly are the bacterial diseases. All right, A parasite affects an oyster and it might affect the way an oyster looks, but it's not going to hurt you if you ingest an oyster that has been infected with parasites. How do we know an oyster or any other bivalve is sick? You can't tell just from looking at the shell. They gape. The more they gape, the sicker they are until there's no meat left in them. Uh, you can actually run your hands over oysters or clams or any bivalves they open to feed too. So if you run your hands over the top of the water and they think you're a predator, if they're healthy, they'll close right up. 
But if they're not, they don't. And the longer it takes them to close, the sicker they are and the closer they are to death. Perkinsis, or as we refer to it, dermo. This is a common disease in Florida, both the Gulf and Atlantic side. And it was thought to have originated in this area and been transported elsewhere. It affects not only oysters, but also mussels and probably other bivalves as well to some extent. It is found all up and down the eastern seaboard um, and then in the Caribbean. This is a parasite that is directly transmitted. That means the oyster is its host. It doesn't have any other animals that it infects. Uh, I hope you can tell the difference between the healthy oyster and the one that's suffering from Perkinsis. Uh, I know which one I would rather eat, okay? We have a nifty little way to look for dermo. It's uh, real easy. We take a little bit of the oyster tissue, we put it in, in a tube of media, and what it does is it causes the spores to swell. We put a little iodine on the slide and on the tissue, and the spores pop out. So this is a, would be a light infection. All the little dark things are the spores. This is a heavy infection. Now, this oyster is still alive, all right? He probably won't make it through the spring, but he, they're all still alive when we take these samples. Associations with dermo are high salinity and high temperatures, and that will be important later. Another of the, well, the, these are the two big diseases when we think about oyster diseases are Perkinsis and haplosporidiosis. Uh, we like acronyms, and we refer to this as MSX, which is because for a long time we didn't know what ca was causing the oysters to die. This disease has been around since about the 1950s on the eastern seaboard. We don't have it in Florida. Its southern range is Virginia currently. Even though we now know what parasite causes these two related diseases, we don't, there's an unknown host in between. Otherwise, you cannot take a sick oyster and put it with a healthy oyster. That healthy oyster will not get this disease. There's some other host involved. It could be another mollusk. It could be a worm. A worm's probably the most, that's what most people think it is. Some other host that also transmit this. And if you took a look at an oyster that was affected with haplosporidiosis, if you opened it up, you couldn't tell whether it was dermo or haplosporidiosis that was causing it to be ill. You'd have to do further tests to see which, which one is. For this one, we don't have a, a nifty, easy test. We have to use histology, which involves taking tissue samples, putting them on a slide, and then staining them. Oyster tissue does not have this nifty pink and purple color. The pink is where the um, parasite is found. Again, the association was, is with high salinities and high temperatures. If I would have been giving this talk two years ago, instead of the talk I gave on lobsters, I would not be talking about this disease because it wasn't a, a big deal. But we at Harbor Branch have a connection uh, with this disease that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, as you can see from these older pictures, the range is throughout a lot of Europe, the west coast of North America, and a little bit in Maine, although they haven't had a big problem with that. This is another one of these where the oyster is the definitive host. There's no other host in between. It affects the blood cells instead of just the tissue. And again, histology or cytology because the blood cells are two ways we can use to determine whether we have the parasite. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there are little tiny round things within the blood cells. The associations, again, that are in common with the two parasites we just talked about are high salinity and high temperatures. 
Denman Island disease. I really don't have a lot of experience with this disease because it's only found on the west coast of the United States um, and only with uh, species, well, it affects both species of Crestostria, but um, mainly Pacifica, the Pacific oyster. It has pretty distinct nasty lesions instead of just looking watery like and a little thin and not a lot of meat. It actually has, uh, it's pretty distinct yellow and green pustules. This one has a different association if you notice and it kind of makes sense why you would only see it in Canada and Washington State. The temperatures it's associated with are low temperatures and it doesn't really have an association with salinity. Now we're going to move on from parasites to bacteria and we're going to talk about a little bit about Vibrio. Anybody that works with uh, marine species, whether it's fish or clams or oysters or shrimp, will run into problems with Vibrio. Vibrio is always in the water column. It's an opportunistic disease. It's a secondary pathogen and it comes out when animals are stressed and they have a poor immune system. We consider it in aquaculture a hatchery disease. That's where we see problems with it causing die-off in hatchery situations. When it becomes a problem with humans as is because they are filter feeders and if you eat undercooked or raw seafood where they contain a lot of this bacteria that they've been filtering out of the water, we have health problems with this. Um, this became a notifiable disease according to the CDC in 2007 because of the rise of this disease and they wanted to, to keep better track of it. Another bacterial disease we see and we definitely consider this a hatchery disease and it's only in a small area which is the northeast Atlantic seaboard is something called JOD. Now if I would have been given this presentation two years ago I would have still talked about this but this would have fallen under unknown etiology. We don't know what causes it. They always suspected a bacterial disease, but only in 2007 did they find the real cause of it. Um, hasn't been around for very long as far as we know. Uh, first reported in 1984 and it's, it's hung up with in the northeastern United States. Again, the association with, is with high temperatures and high salinities. Okay, now on to the two diseases that we don't know what the cause is. We've got something called summer mortality, which I bet you can guess what its association is. Um, if you see it in the summer, you see warm temperatures. It affects a wide variety of species, uh, Osteria as well, but mostly Castosteria gigas. This is the most cultured species in the world, actually. So it's one everybody pays attention to. And it's associated with a lot of different things. They think it might be bacterial or viral in origin, but they think that there has to be other stress pressures for it to come out, like low dissolved oxygen, like um, too much runoff of fertilizer or from cities. Um, and it tends to be in oysters that are getting ready to spawn and so they don't have, a, they put all their energy into that and not into their immune system. This year in France, just this past year, they lost almost 100% of their uh, Pacific oyster crop. And that's important because France is the biggest commercial producer of um, oysters in Europe. Malpaquet disease, and I don't know French, so I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, um, is also one of unknown etiology. A parasite suspected, and uh, the Canadians kind of blame us for giving this disease to them, although we've never seen it ourselves, because uh, the story goes that it first reared its head in 1915 in a batch of Chrysostia virginica that they got from somewhere on the northeastern Atlantic seaboard. It uh, wiped out all their oysters and 
they actually kind of formed naturally resistant stocks because they just kept moving it around, not knowing why the oysters were dying at that point in time. By 1950, their oysters quit dying, and so all, they, all the oysters that were there were now replaced with naturally resistant stocks. But they thought, well, it's gone. So in the 1960s, they transplanted some oysters that had never been exposed to this disease from Cape Britain, the last uh, stronghold of, of we don't have this disease, by Cape Britain, Prince Edward Island. And lo and behold, 40 years, well, 10 years later, and then do my math, 40 years later, every time they tried transplanting them, they would, the new oysters would be infected with the disease. So it's still harbored there somewhere, either the oyster population's carriers or there are probably other mollusk species or maybe a secondary host, since we don't know what causes it, that is harboring the species there. In 2007, uh, Prince Edward Island and Cape Britain, the last two areas in the maritime eastern part of Canada that were free of the disease, succumbed to this disease too. So now it's endemic in Canada. and. Uh, it's all their oyster population. So, but they have naturally resistant stocks, and that's the way they deal with it. Okay, I promised you a little bit about climate change. This is a hot topic nowadays. Uh, you're going to hear about it in some of the other talks that you're going to hear from other researchers within the next coming weeks. It's going to be part of their talks as well. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about what climate is versus whether versus global warming because we tend to mix all that up together and, and call it all the same thing and it really isn't. Climate is more a seasonal pattern. Um, if you're from New York, you come down here to escape the cold because we have a tropical climate. You expect it to be warm. Now sometimes it's not as warm as you want it to be like a couple weeks ago. That is weather. Okay, weather is what you want, a nice sunny hot day and what you get, a cold day. Um, global warming, the rise of temperature, causes climate change. And climate change isn't just a rise in temperature. It can also be precipitation can be affected, uh, sea level rise. There's a lot of other things that come to play with climate change. And it's not homogenous. So when you say global warming, it might get warmer where you live, it might not, it might get colder. So what's messed up is all the patterns of wind and current uh, and a lot of other things. It, it, there's an awful lot we don't know and we, all we can do as scientists is, is make conjectures. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about whether climate change and global warming are man-made or not because that is, that is one thing that people don't agree on, although we do all agree that it's happening and something does need to be done. As you can see with this chart from NOAA, um, there has been a rise. The red line is the mean rise. And here's where you get your little weather events, the black areas that's, you know, one day we may have a, uh, one year we may have a higher temperature, the next year we ha may have a lower temperature, but still, if you draw a line through here, the mean, the trend has been to warmer climate. Some of the things that we might see and we are seeing as we have climate change are changes in temperature. And like I said, this isn't something that you can just say, well, everything's going to get one or two degrees hotter. But it isn't very, it is really important because it influences a lot of feeding activity where species live, timing of reproduction, do they have the right foods, uh, have those species gone by the wayside or moved to another area? And so it's important in that way. Precipitation is also something that we're not sure when and where we're going to, pre they predict that there's going to be an increase in intensity and frequency of drought, storms, but it's kind of hard to predict exactly when and where. Carbon dioxide, we all have heard about greenhouse gases and that we have more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. 
and a lot of it ends up in the ocean. The absor ocean absorbs a lot of it. And with that, we get some acidification, which impacts coral reef formation. And we will have some talks, I'm sure, that in the coming weeks that will focus on that. And also shell formation. And then sea level rise. Sea level rise will probably create conflicts between habitat and humans because as the level rises, there go your marshes and your mangroves and your estuaries as saltwater intrusion comes in. And where are those species going to go? You know, they want to move away from it, and they can't because we're there. Or they have to adapt or, and change or, again, go by the wayside. So a lot of things to consider. Some of these may, in the future, we find out in hindsight, be more important than others. Uh, but they're all likely scenarios and things that we as scientists have to be prepared for. So we're going to focus on temperature and its effects on the diseases we've talked about, say a little bit about food safety, a little bit about uh, heavy metals as a type of pollution, and talk a little bit about ocean acidification and its um, impact on shell formation. One thing that we are already seeing is poleward spread of warm water pathogens as the temperature rises. Uh, also, with that, we'll see poleward expansion of uh, warm water species as well. Animals in a marine environment have different tolerances for what they can live in versus what they can grow in versus what they can reproduce in. Although they might be able to live in that environment, uh, it may impact reproduction and growth. And it also weakens their immune system such as We'll, we are probably going to see an increase in non-infectious diseases like water quality diseases and in opportunistic diseases uh, like Vibrio. Another impact with uh, storm surges and that type of thing will be an increase in terrestrial runoff that increases um, eutrophification, blooms of algae and things like that which can impact food safety and can increase uh, or decrease oxygen in the water. And that kind of thing doesn't just, all this stuff, although I'm talking about oysters, it's not the only thing it's going to impact. Now, fair is fair, and we may see some positive benefits of this, and that is cold water pathogens will probably decrease as it warms. Um, uh, of course, the Cold water species are going to have their area shrink as well, so it's kind of tit for tat. Of the diseases we've talked about tonight, or that I've talked about tonight, we have three where expansion, poleward expansion, has been documented already. A couple where expansion is likely, uh, one where shrinkage is likely. This was the cold water disease. And of course, if we don't know what's causing something and we don't know what it's in association with environmental temperatures and salinities are, we don't have a clue as to what's going to happen with those kind of diseases. And I could take those 20 diseases worldwide and I could put them in these categories too. First, we'll talk about Perkinsis and dermal or dermal. Um, we already have warm temperatures here in Florida. And so one thing that they found out is, in our area at least, salinity plays more of a role than temperature in the spread of the disease. And so what we see is when we have a La Nina event, which is drier drought conditions, that's when we see a higher amount of Perkinsis in this area, whereas we see less of it, less intense amounts of it, when we have cool, wet years like we do with an El Nino event. And what's happened since the 1970s is these events have just been more rapid, more prevalent. They stick around longer. In the uh, northeastern seaboard, we have seen an expansion of Perkinsis. Uh, that's been coupled, unfortunately, with MSX so that areas up there are getting a one-two punch as far as diseases go. Um, 
And you can kind of see the expansion from the Chesapeake Bay northward to the Delaware Bay and finally to, to Maine. And this same graph will work really well for the next slide too when we talk about MSX and its poleward expansion. And you can see that, yeah, over harvesting already was doing a number, uh, but you combine that with diseases and you throw in warming temperatures and everything just plummets, and that's what's happened in those areas. Uh, Haplosporidion has also seen a warming trend, a northward expansion into Canada. Uh, it was never seen in Canada before 2002, and I should have had a, a nice little map of Canada when I was talking about Malpica disease, uh, but Prince Edward Island and Cape Britain were hit with a one-two punch as well. They got MSX for the first time in 2002, and then in 2007, they got uh, Malpica disease. Vibrio is another pathogen where we have seen an expansion, and this one does definitely affect humans, uh, not just in an uh, ecological sense for cleaning the water, but also in a health sense. And it had never been seen in Alaska before 2004. Previously, the northernmost range was in British Columbia. What happened is that we've been seeing a warming trend in the Gulf of Alaska for about the past 15 years. And that particular year, we saw in the areas where shellfish that caused a problem were harvested, the water never got below 15 degrees centigrade that year in those areas. Uh, so they've had oscillating temperatures, sometimes it's below 15, sometimes it's, it's above in the Gulf of Alaska, but they're, what they're seeing is longer periods where they have this high temperature. We've also seen, it, seen an increase in uh, Vibrio cases on both coasts in this past decade and also in Europe. Now, I'll talk about this one just because we have a Florida connection here. And I'll talk a little bit about Chrysostria areakensis. I mentioned it before as one of the species, uh, well, I've mentioned it before. It's not one of the species we eat. It's actually an Asian oyster. And it was brought over here to try to replace the poor population of the American or Eastern oyster on the North Atlantic seaboard. Um, and so there was a lot of money a lot of uh, research done with, is this a better oyster? Should we use it? Uh, and they put it in the water in North Carolina, and they noticed they had a lot of mortalities, and they found that it had this bonamia parasite. Well, John and I were working with uh, Chrysostria areakensis to see if it could grow down here in Florida so that if the northeastern Atlantic seaboard states decided to go with this program, then would we see uh, an example of this exotic oyster make its way down to here? Otherwise, could it live in our climate? And would that be a problem to our own oysters? Would that be a problem with Virginica? And lo and behold, we found that we have it in our Florida waters. We still don't know exactly what oyster is harboring it. Obviously, something not edible, or we would have seen it before. Um, we have found it in Virginica, but it doesn't seem to cause disease or mortality uh, as it does in area Kansas. And there are other studies to back that up that Virginica and Gygus aren't, they're tolerant to it. Food safety. We have to consider this with the bacteria. Like I said, par parasites we don't. Um, and we talked about Vibrium, we'll have a slide about that. Another thing that impacts shellfish um, harvest is harmful algal blooms. Red tides, we call them here. You can have them in fresh water too. A lot of brown tides, they can be different types of colors. And we have seen that over the years, they become more frequent, more intense, and they stay around a lot longer. They get concentrated in bivalves and other filter feeders. Those animals, oysters, don't die from HABs like 
some fish species do and other things do, but they accumulate them. And they've got these wonderful names, paralytic shellfish poisoning, diuretic, they tell what they do. Uh, and, and none of them sound too pleasant to me. This is uh, one that we have here. Uh, the other nasties are further north on the eastern seaboard or on the west coast. I told you Vibrio has, had been a problem. Why was it a problem with its range expansion in Alaska? Its problem was in the food safety, not with the oyster. The oyster could have cared less if it was filtering Vibrio. Why that mattered is because we eat the oysters that are filtering the Vibrio, and then we get these infections. Uh, we call them an upset stomach. They, they could be other things. They could be the Norwalk virus. They could be salmonella, but they could also be Vibrio. And we have two of them that we worry about. The most common one, fortunately, uh, only a, usually in most people just causes acute gastroenteritis. You just, oh, I ate some bad shellfish. And you usually don't even have to go to the doctor and get any antibiotics or anything for it. The other one is, is a nastier bug, but fortunately it's more rare, although we do have a fair amount of cases reported in the Gulf Coast states. And if you're healthy, this one's no worse than that one. It's in people who are taking drugs because they've had cancer or organ transplants or in other ways are immunocompromised so that their immune system is down. Then they can get a system-wide infection with it, and, and that's never a good thing. What can we do to prevent, uh, if we like to eat raw oysters, what, what, how can you do it? How can you get around that? Well, you can get rid of it in bacteria as long as you don't eat them raw. Steam them, cook them, uh, put them in chowder. They're good that way. They've found that as long as you keep them, uh, here's a trick, in temperatures above 15 degrees centigrade, they do fine. But a lot of times when they're being shipped elsewhere, inland to people who don't grow oysters, you don't, you know, you really don't know if they were kept in a refrigerated truck or how long they sat on the tarmac and all that type of stuff. With aquaculture, we can do something called depuration, where we put them in uh, areas that don't have Vibrio, or we put them in land-based hatcheries, and just let them filter good water, and then we will expel that Vibrio over time. The other thing that's done is shellfish bed closures. Uh, and there are people, I don't know what state agency really regulates it, that that's their job, is to just go around and monitor the bacterial population along the beaches that you swim, where shellfish are harvested, and look at the bacterial populations, and also look for harmful algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms are a little bit different because you can't cook it, it won't make a difference. You can't, it's not the organism itself that's causing the problem, it's a toxin that they produce. So your best bet is just not to eat it. Um, and like I said, shellfish bed closures work for both of these. And we're going to just spend one slide talking about uh, pollution and heavy metals. There are other people here who do a lot of this. Too bad Amber's not here because she does a little bit of work with this with apple snails is, is looking at copper poisoning. Uh, and what we have found, and I'm just going to use this as an example with heavy metals, is things that are common in our estuaries, uh, somebody decides they're at a low enough levels that they're tolerable for, for filter feeders like oysters and they're not going to kill them. And that is true as long as the rest of the water quality is fine. Uh, and research that has been done within the last couple years has shown that even at low temperatures, oysters that are exposed to low level, tolerable levels of cadmium, increase their oxygen intake, which is an indication that they're stressed out. But they don't die from that. However, if you add high temperatures to the mix, then you get mortality. They either cannot obtain oxygen or they can't convert it into energy, one of the two, or both. They're not 100% sure how it works. They just know that the cause is mortality. We're going to switch gears and take a look at ocean acidification. And I, like I said, you'll hear more about this from the coral, coral group, I'm sure, in a couple weeks. Uh, so I'll give you a little summation of it, and they'll probably delve into it a lot more.
But ocean acidification is caused by an increase in carbon dioxide emissions, which produces carbonic acid. If you have a chemistry background, you've got the whole thing over here. Um, that causes a reduction in pH and increases ocean acidic, uh, acidity. It dissolves calcium carbonate. Oyster shells, bivalve shells, have calcium carbonate as part of their makeup, and so do corals. So do some of the other things in the plankton. And one of the things that they think that we'll see is, is a change in the type of plankton. Uh, traditionally, the levels have been 8.2. Currently, they're 8.1. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? But they're projected to go down to 7.8 within the next 100 year, 50 to 100 years. And that will uh, potentially cause a couple problems. And so we're going to look at two studies that focused on shell growth in bivalves. The first study was done in 2007 and they looked at pre-industrial levels of CO2 in the water and, and the pH that was associated with that. They looked at our current levels and they looked at what's projected in 50 years and what's projected in 100 years. And what they found when they compared Chrysostria virginica and Chrysostria ariacensis was that virginica was negatively affected it had a lot less shell growth and a lot less calcification. It didn't seem to bother the Sumino oyster. So there are some species that already are adapted to handle a change in uh, acidification and others that are, that are going to have to adapt to it or their populations are going to plummet. Then there was another study done last year in 2009 where they looked at even higher levels and they looked at a lot more species. They looked at mollusks a variety, urchins, coral, and crustaceans. And one thing they found is that it all depends on what you are, whether you're positively or negatively affected by uh, lowering pH levels in the ocean. What this does for bivalves, including oyster, is it means the shell grows more slowly, they're in the plankton longer, Therefore, they're a prey item longer. And so maybe that 1% doesn't settle. Maybe it's less than that. How much less? We don't know. And when they do settle, they're going to have less calcium in their shells. So they're going to, again, be easier prey for things like crabs. So that's something else the oyster has to worry about. In 2005, based on this type of information, and you can see where we fall in this, and we fare a little bit better than some other areas do, some group up in the Chesapeake Bay area asked the government to consider the American oyster threatened or endangered. Um, I don't know what has become of that. I don't think there has actually been anything, but because their shellfish industry was decimated so much, and you can see that there are areas where the oyster population is functionally extinct, which means it's going to be hard for them to make a comeback with diseases and overharvesting, environmental degradation, and, and then add climate change to it. Where those that are in fair and good condition, they have a, a much better chance at making it. So, what can we do about this, or what are some of the things that we can do about this? And there is probably more than what I'm touching on here. Well, we can restrict movement in aquaculture, so we restrict the spread of diseases. Um, we can do selective breeding programs to make a tolerant oyster. And we can focus on restoration efforts with either native species or non-native species. Restriction of movement seems to be kind of common sense and yet there are people who say well you got Perkinsis in Florida you got Perkinsis up here in Massachusetts we already got it let's move things around uh, but there are strains of Perkinsis they're finding out by doing molecular biology and so your Florida oyster is used to the Florida strain your Massachusetts oyster might not enjoy that strain as much. They're not used to it. They haven't, haven't adapted to it. And so 
the bottom line is you probably shouldn't introduce things from areas that have been infected historically. Quarantine areas. Australia takes all their shellfish beds and they assign them risk factors. And they allow movement from a low risk factor for a certain disease. Um, but if they're in a high risk disease, they don't allow it to move to a low risk disease. Another thing you can do is something that I do. Here I am looking for dermo. Uh, you can test for diseases of concern before you move them around. You can issue certifications to farmers, and there are a lot of states do require this for Perkinsis and for Haplosporidium. Um, I think a lot of that's for Haplosporidium. They don't want that spread around. I don't think as many people care as much about the Perkinsis. Um, but some states are really restrictive about it. Others aren't. Georgia is very restrictive in their laws. Up in the Chesapeake, where they already got a big problem and not too many shellfish, they're not as picky about movement for their industry. Select a breeding, breeding tolerant oysters. Uh, there's been wor work done on breeding MSX resistant oysters for the Chesapeake area. One thing to keep in mind is something tolerant can still have the disease and we can use the Malpake Bay oysters as our uh, lesson learned in that one. Just because it doesn't seem that any of your oysters are dying from that anymore doesn't mean they don't have the disease. It may mean they're just slower to develop it, which allows you to, it to reach market size and, and be harvested uh, and gives more time for the population to reproduce itself. So it's not disease free. You don't want to put a disease tolerant oyster or any other disease tolerant animal in an area where you've never seen that disease. Another interesting thing that they're starting to do is to look at div, uh, selective breeding for um, ones that can tolerate lower pH. So that's kind of a new frontier and a new area that's being looked at. This is simply a picture of um, disease tolerant QX oysters and non-tolerant, naive, never been exposed to oysters bred for something called Queensland X disease in Australia. And they've had a very successful program with this. Restoration, native species or non-native species is what we're going to talk about. One, they've, they've learned some lessons with all the restoration work they've done. And in some areas it works and some it hasn't. They've not been very successful at all in the Chesapeake Bay, mainly because they put oysters out to do restoration and they get hit by diseases. And, and so it kind of wipes out the restoration efforts, which is why they've looked at other things. But timing is very important. If, if you know the disease is infective in the summer, you want to wait until fall to put your juvenile oysters out for restoration. You want to get them at least a year's head start on a disease. So timing is very important and you need to know the timing. And that timing is temperature and salinity dependent. So it's not necessarily just the time of the year. Type of restoration. There's actually been some work done recently at VIMS that shows that reef height matters. And they looked at um, low reefs, medium sized reefs, and, and high reefs. And here's a high reef uh, down in Lake Worth that John and I monitor. Uh, what they found is those that have a higher reef height, at least in their studies, suffer less mortality from diseases and pollution and everything else. Another thing to look at when you restore with native species is the amount of disease levels. In some areas, it might not be worth your while. Maybe you ought to concentrate on areas with lower salinity if high salinity is a problem, areas that historically have better water quality. And what's your purpose of restoration? Uh, this has been purported to be some of the problems with restoring things in the Northeast Atlantic seaboard. Their oyster fisheries have been decimated so much that they are actually restoring for the oyster fishermen. And so it's not working very well for ecosystem restoration when you allow fishing in the areas, that oyster harvest in the areas you've just restored. Restoration with non-native species. Uh, this is something that I said earlier they were really looking at to replace virginica. And this was something that John and I had a little bit involvement here with Harbor Branch. The end result was they decided not to do it. Uh, 
It's a big oyster. It has a lot of meat on it. That's a quarter down there. Some of the reasons not to are, I think, kind of lessons learned. Competition with the native species. How would it, would it outcompete Virginica? And what would that do all along the eastern seaboard, not just where they were having problems up here? And that has been shown to happen previously. And then unwanted exotic species. A lot of times when you're, you're introducing a species, particularly a bivalve, that have all these other little tunicates and mussels and things on them, you're introducing hitchhikers, if you will. You're introducing a lot of things you don't want to introduce along with the oyster. And there's a track record for that, too. So a couple of suggestions to save our ecosystem and perhaps some oysters left over for us to eat. Uh, we need to improve protection, keep some things off limits for oyster fisheries. Do what we can to restore and recover the reefs uh, with the restoration projects. And do it in such a way that it not only provides an ecosystem, but everybody's happy. You can perhaps have areas where you do have oyster fisheries going on at the same time, which brings us to this point. Stop the inter intentional introduction and spread of non-native shellfish. I mean, you get all the other problems along with it. Uh, maybe out competing the other species and, and having those exotic hitchhikers coming along with it. And improve water quality in our bays and estuaries. Otherwise, be long-term sighted and not just short-term sighted. Uh, it's not just about us. It's also about the fish and the birds and the invertebrates that are in these oyster habitats. And that is the end of our talk. And, uh, you can see a little bit of what we do here. We get down and dirty, uh, and we also enjoy ourselves. <laughs>